Beloved, grace and peace be unto you. From our God who loves us as mother and father and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. Won't you bow and be in prayer with me as we prepare our hearts, our minds and our lives to receive what God would say and speak to us on today. God, we come before you grateful for the brand new mercies that we've walked in, the sufficient grace that we've experienced. We come to this moment now surrendering our lives to you, asking that our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our mouths, our hands would all be transformed into fertile soil, ready to receive the seed of your word. God, teach us now to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. That we may not only walk in the benefit and the blessing and the beauty of your word, but that we would touch others with the power of your word. In the blessed name of the incarnate word, Jesus our Christ, we do pray. Amen. Beloved, I'm going to invite you to journey with me, if you will, today into the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel. And as you're turning to the third chapter of 1 Samuel, let me share that this past week, with the grace of God, some more than 12,500 individuals joined in with us as we began our covenant prayer and time of fasting for 40 days, seeking the face of God, the will of God, the voice of God, the presence of God, and more importantly, the power of God. If you are one of those individuals that are seeking God with us right now, I pray that this first week has been productive and that you begin to experience the power that Jesus declares only comes through prayer and fasting. You remember as we began on last week this journey into seek that I suggested to you that all of us have the propensity and the proclivity of straying away from God. The Bible says that we all are like sheep that we've wandered and gone astray. And you'll recall that I want to reiterate time and again that bad things happen when you stray from God. You know you're straying from God when you become callous to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and become comfortable in a lifestyle of sin. You know you're straying from God when there's been a diminish in your prayer time and your frequency of studying the word of God. You know you're straying from God when you become unapologetically offensive to other people as if what you say no longer matters. You know you're straying from God when you have a weakened and a weak end worship life. And you know that when there's a loss of joy and peace in your life, you are dangerously distant from the will of God. But the good news from the prophet Jeremiah that we reclaimed last week was that God says it doesn't have to be that way. God says that when we stray, it can be fixed. That you don't have to be in a place where you can't hear from God. You don't have to live a life void of the passion and power that comes from the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be in a place where you feel as if you're praying and God isn't answering. God declares we can fix this, but the ownership is on you. You've got to seek me and you've got to do it with your whole heart. And as we continue in this space of seeking God with our whole hearts, I want you to hear the reading of 1 Samuel chapter 3 that sets the stage for this second lesson of journeying into the will of God. If you would listen for the word of God from 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. I'm reading out of the New International Version, knowing that your Bible reads similarly. The word of God begins, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord unto Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. 
And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And the Lord said to Sam then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Hang out there in that ninth verse again. Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. One of the primary goals of SEEK that's relevant and real for all of us is to reach a place where we can distinguish the voice of God in our lives. To reach that place when we know when and how it is that God speaks to us to discern the direction that God is calling us in, to be able to hear the voice of God and know what God wills for us, to be able to pray and hear God answer and we obey. In John chapter 10, Jesus is teaching and he makes this statement that I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. The context in which he was speaking were back in those days, shepherds, would sometimes wind up in the same field with different flocks. And as the shepherds mingled together, so would the sheep. And it was time for a shepherd to leave. He would speak out and all of his sheep, regardless of what the other sheep were doing or what the other shepherds were saying, those sheep from those flock would follow their shepherd and their shepherd alone. And Jesus declares that that's really what I'd require of my followers, that you know the voice of God. And regardless of what other people are doing in their lives, regardless of the other voices around you, you know how to distinguish and discern the voice of God and obey the call of God in your own life. And yet, if the truth be told, all of us have multiple moments in life where it's difficult for us to discern the will of God. It's hard to hear the voice of God. We struggle to know what God is calling of us and expects of us and desires of us and wants for us to do. All of us struggle at times with knowing what is God's will for my life. 
that's exactly where we find Samuel right here in chapter three. He's struggling with the will of God. Remember that Samuel from Sunday school is the son of Elkanah. We find out later in First Chronicles that Elkanah is a Levite. He's of the priestly order. Elkanah has two wives, Penina and Hannah. Penina has many children. Hannah is barren and has birthed no children. And the Bible says that Penina makes Hannah's life miserable. That Penina always mocks Hannah for her inability to have children. Hannah is so distraught by the mocking of Penina and her being barren that she goes into the temple, the house of the Lord, and she weeps and she prays. And in her weeping and in her praying, she cries out to the Lord. Her mouth moves, but there are no words coming out. And Eli, the priest, sees her and thinks she's drunk. And he tells her to stop drinking wine. And she says, I'm not drunk. I'm crying out to the Lord for the Lord to grant me a child. Well, God hears and God answers Hannah's prayer and gives her a son. And in thanksgiving to the Lord answering her prayer, Hannah does three things. Number one, she names the boy Samuel. The Bible says that Hannah declared, for this child I prayed. And the name Samuel is a combination of two words. It's a combination of the word El, which means God, and the verb Samuel, which means to place. Samuel literally means God has placed. Hannah has prayed for a child and God has placed a child in her womb and she names the child Samuel. Secondly, in thanksgiving to God, she dedicates Samuel as a Nazarite. You will recall from the book of Judges and in the life of Samson that a Nazarite is one who drinks no wine, who has no haircut, and who does not touch unholy things. And not only does she name him Samuel, not only does she dedicate him as a Nazarite, but she gives him back to Eli the priest, the one who thought she was drunk. And she requests that her son Samuel be raised all of his life in the house of the Lord as a servant to the Lord. And Samuel is raised by Eli. This Samuel that we see being given to the Lord will rise up as one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. Samuel is regarded as one of the great men of faith. Ty, he's one of the few men who are venerated by all three Abrahamic faith traditions. Judaism lifts up Samuel. Christianity lifts up Samuel. Islam lifts up Samuel. Samuel is regarded as a prophet who speaks for God and is pleasing to the Lord. Samuel is reverenced and respected by all of Israel and they run to Samuel when they want to know what the will of the Lord is. It is Samuel who leads the children of Israel in victorious battle against the Philistines when they stand at Mizpah. And when Israel wants a king because they want to look like everyone else, Samuel hears the word from God and shares with them a word of warning. It is Samuel who hears God point out Saul and anoints him as king. And when Saul, when Saul loses favor with God, it is Samuel who hears God say, no longer Saul. It is Samuel whom God speaks to and says David ought to be the next king. It is Samuel who anoints David to be king. There's nobody like Samuel. If anybody knew what God was saying, if anybody heard the voice of God, if anybody was sure and certain about what God was requiring of Israel, it was Samuel. Therefore, it might surprise you that when we are reintroduced to Samuel 
In 1 Samuel chapter 3, he's a young man who's still living in the house of the Lord under the leadership of Eli. And we find in chapter 3 that Samuel is struggling with the same thing I struggle with and the same thing you're going to struggle with. Samuel cannot discern the voice of God. This Samuel who would speak for the Lord has trouble hearing God call him and know that God has an assignment for him. He doesn't know what God's will for his life is. God is calling and Samuel cannot discern it. He struggles in the same way that we do, trying to understand what God requires of him. Come on back to 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's late one night and Eli who's grown old and is beginning to lose his sight, is laying in bed sleep. Samuel is sleeping by the Ark of the Covenant. And while he's there, the Lord calls his name, Samuel. Samuel hears it and he gets up and he runs to Eli and says, you called me. Eli says, Samuel, I did not call you. Go lay back down. He lays back down and again, God calls him Samuel. Samuel hears it, but he doesn't know it's God. So he gets up again and he runs to Eli and he says, you called me. Eli says, I did not call you. Go lay down again. He lays down again. God calls again. He gets up and runs to Eli again. God keeps calling him and Samuel cannot discern that it is the voice of God. He does not know that God has a purpose for him, that God has an assignment for him, that God is speaking because Samuel cannot discern the voice of God. He doesn't know the will of God. He can't distinguish the voice of God. It's a reminder to us that all of us can struggle hearing the voice of God. And hear me, Tiffany, the problem is not that God isn't speaking. Here's what happens. God calls Samuel. Samuel gets it wrong. God calls him again. Samuel gets it wrong. God calls him again. Samuel gets it wrong. God calls him again. Samuel gets it wrong. God keeps calling and calling and calling and speaking and speaking and speaking and revealing and revealing and revealing. Why? Because God wants Samuel to know his voice. I come by to tell you that God wants you to know his voice. God wants you to know his will for your life. God wants you to hear his revelation of his desires for your every day. Here's the truth that if you desire to know the will of God, God desires for you to hear it. If you desire to know the will of God, God desires for you to hear it. God is not playing some mystical game with you where he wants to hide his will and make it mysterious. God is not sitting in heaven saying, let me make this as difficult as possible for her and as problematic as I can for him. God wants you to know. God wants you to hear. God wants to reveal his will for you. And here is the grace of God, that even when we don't get it right, he keeps calling. Even when we aren't obedient, he keeps speaking. Even when we don't discern it, God keeps showing up and calling us and speaking to us. The challenge is not with God speaking. The challenge is with our ability to hear. God is calling. Samuel can't discern. Why is it that Samuel struggles discerning the will of God, the voice of God? Well, there's some obstacles that stand in his way. And I would suggest to you that we can learn a lot from Samuel and what causes him not to be able to clearly hear the voice of God because it might be hindering you and me from clearly discerning God's voice and God's will for our lives. What stands between us 
and clearly discerning God's will. Well, if you hang out in Samuel, you'll find a few things. It starts with this mail that, that God calls Samuel and Samuel runs to Eli. God calls Samuel again and Samuel runs to Eli. God calls Samuel again and Samuel runs to Eli. Why does Samuel keep running to Eli? He has confused the voice of God with the voice of Eli. He hears God, but he thinks he needs Eli to tell him what's really going on. He runs to Eli thinking that hearing from Eli is the same thing as hearing from God. How very easy it is to confuse the voice of God with the voice of those you hold in religious esteem. Go on to preach the Bible, Pastor Wesley. Here's why Samuel runs to Eli. Because Samuel has looked up to Eli his whole life. He's a priest. He's holy. And surely if anybody can tell Samuel what God is saying, it's the man he looks up to as holy. Surely anyone who's as holy as Eli with the title of Eli ought to be able to help Samuel understand the word of God and the calling of God and the voice of God. How easily we run to people that we think are holier than us when we struggle with the will of God. We run to people with white collars and robes and big Bibles. How easily we become dependent on them to reveal God's will for us. How easily we, we look up to them to be the voice of God for us. Samuel has run to Eli because he believes that Eli is holy enough to tell him what God really wants. And he's become dependent on Eli to know what God is saying in his own life. Now, beloved, here's the problem. You ready? The problem is that Eli is not as holy as Samuel thinks he is. I want you to read chapter two. You're going to find out that Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And neither one of them boys was worth a dime. They were rotten. They were unholy. They were blasphemous. They did perverted things in the house of the Lord. And the Lord kept warning Eli, restrain your sons. And Eli would not restrain his sons. And God loses favor with Eli because Eli has not done what God has requested him to do. So Samuel is looking up to a man thinking he's holy only for God to declare he's a sinner just like everybody else. I came by to tell you the people you lift up in high holy esteem they're sinners just like you. Don't let that white collar on his neck fool you. He's a sinner just like you. Don't let that sister with the microphone and the robe and the Bible giving a sermon fool you. She's a sinner just like you. Don't let that person who can quote everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation last fool you. They are a sinner just like you. Don't let someone who can pray for 30 minutes in tongues make you think that they are so holy that they can tell you God's will for you better than you can hear it for yourself. Because at the end of the day, they are a sinner just like you. And you set yourself up for a struggle hearing the voice of God when you become dependent on someone else to reveal God's will in your life. Angie, the world is filled with people whose faith is fractured 
because they found out that preacher, that pastor, that bishop, that potentate, that prelate that they looked up to was a sinner just like them. And what broke them was not just finding out that he or she was a sinner, but finding out that they had become dependent upon them to know the word of God in their own life. I don't know who I came to preach this to, but I came by to tell you that God never made you to be dependent upon someone else to know his will for your life. God never made you to be dependent upon some preacher or some pastor or some pope or some bishop or some missionary to know God's will for your life. God wants to speak to you. God didn't call Samuel through Eli. God called Samuel God's self. God wants you to know God's will for yourself. You know what a, you know what a cult is? A C-U-L-T, a cult is any form of religion that wants you dependent on their Eli. A cult is any form of religion that says the only way to know the truth is to be part of their congregation and listen to that person with the microphone. A cult wants you to become dependent upon their priest and their preacher and, and take whatever they say as unquestionable truth. And one of the signs that you are maturing in God is when you can sit in somebody's sanctuary and hear somebody's preacher and tell yourself, something don't sound right about that. You know you're growing when regardless of their title, their position, their authority, the size of their membership, you hear it and something inside you says, I don't know about that. That doesn't sound right to me. I don't receive that. I don't care how big the Bible. I don't care how long the robe. At the end of the day, I hear God for myself because God uses other people not as revelation, but as confirmation. Say that again, Pastor. The role of other people in your life is not to be the primary source of God's revelation, but God uses them as confirmation of what God has or what God will speak over your own life. Stop allowing other people to be the source of revelation. And know that that God only uses them as confirmation because God wants to speak to you directly by yourself. And part of Samuel's problem is that he keeps running to Eli. And you will always have trouble discerning the will of God when you are dependent on someone else. Here's why he's dependent, though. Read on in verse number seven. And verse number seven says that the reason Samuel cannot discern the will of God, watch this, is because he doesn't know the Lord and the word of God has not been revealed to him. The reason Samuel struggles with knowing God's voice and discerning God's will is because he does not know the Lord and the word of God has not been revealed to him. That if you really want to clearly know God's will, you must first know the Lord personally and second, know the word of God spiritually. If you really want to hear what God's will is, if you really want to discern the voice of God, if you want to know what God requires of you, you must first know the Lord, and then you've got to know God's word. You've got to know the Lord. You've got to know the Lord. You, 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 you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because without Christ in your heart, you'll never understand God's voice in your life. Say that again, Pastor. Without Christ in your heart, it is impossible to know the full will of God 
in your life. Jesus must be in your life in order to know the Lord and in order to hear God's word over your life. You can't know God's word until you know God, until you've opened your heart, until you've said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Kendall, I was having this debate with someone one day about the need to have Christ in your heart to understand the will of God. And the brother asked me a real good question. He said, does that mean unbelievers shouldn't pray? Should someone who doesn't have Christ in their heart, should they not pray because they can't hear the will of God without Christ in their heart? I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. An unbeliever can and should pray. But an unbeliever will never be able to discern the full will of God because when an unbeliever prays, the very first thing God says is you need Jesus. So an unbeliever can pray, uh, God, should I take this job or not? And God's answer is you need Jesus. An unbeliever can pray, Lord, save my marriage. And God's reply is you need Jesus. An unbeliever can ask God, should I go left or should I go right? And God's response is not left or right. God's response is you need Jesus because you cannot discern the full will of God in your life without Christ in your heart. Okay, okay, okay. I see someone, uh, you're, not, you're not feeling me. Let me help this. What's your favorite radio station? What, what, what's your favorite radio station that you listen to? Well, I know I should tell you mine is 104.1. That's the religious station, but I, I wouldn't be truthful. Uh, my, my favorite radio station, uh, don't tell nobody, is 95.5. Yeah, I, I like the blend of hip hop and R&B. Yeah, 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 so I listen to 95.5. Nah, that, that's my favorite radio station. Now, here's what you may find amazing. 95.5, whatever radio station you listen to, is always broadcasting. The radio waves are hitting you right now, wherever you are. But I'm not hearing 95.5 right now. Even though the radio waves are right here and hitting me, I can't hear 95.5. Why? Because I don't have a receiver. I don't have the unit that allows me to receive the broadcast and hear what 95.95 is playing. It's, it's broadcasting, it's, it's playing, the music is coming out, but I can't receive it because I don't have anything on me that is tuned in and can receive the broadcast. And that's what prohibits Samuel and prohibits us from receiving the broadcast of God. God is always speaking. God is always revealing. God is always showing his hand. But if you don't have the receiver of Jesus Christ in your heart, you will never be able to hear the full broadcast of God's will because it starts with having the right equipment in your life. And that's Jesus Christ. You have to know God. And then the Bible says that Samuel couldn't hear because he didn't know the word of God. Listen, I say this all the time at Alfred Street. Read your Bible. It'll make you a better Christian. Reading your Bible is essential to being able to discern God's will for your life. Reading God's word daily is essential for being able to learn how to know God's voice. Reading the word of God is essential for knowing what God's will for your life is. You know what the Bible is? In some ways, the Bible is simply a record of how God reacts to humanity. It's a written record of what God requires of his people. It's a written record of how God responds to our holiness and our unrighteousness. It, it, it's a written record of what God requests of us to walk by faith. It, it's a written record of how God responds to our prayers. So that every time I open the Bible and every time I read a psalm or a chapter in Exodus or some of the Gospels or a letter of Paul. Every time I read, I'm literally learning 
God's language. Every time I read, I'm learning how God talks and when God talks and how God responds and what makes God respond and how God operates and what God does and how God calls. Every time I read, I'm learning to speak God's language. Every time I read the Bible, I'm learning that weeping only endures for a night, but joy will come in the morning. When I read the word, I'm learning that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When, when I read the Bible, I find out that whatever was meant for evil, my God can turn it to my good. I'm learning that if I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding, he will direct my path. Every time I open the Bible, I'm learning God's language. And learning God's language helps me discern God's voice so that I can hear God for myself. Samuel's problem, he was dependent on Eli. Samuel's problem, he did not know the Lord and he did not know the word of God. But there's another obstacle there. And this one's going to get a little difficult. The Bible tells us in chapter 2 that Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who I told you wasn't worth a dime. Hophni and Phinehas were wretched and ratchet. Everyone knew these boys were ungodly. Everyone knew that Eli hadn't restrained them. Everyone knew that Eli had gotten a word from the Lord about judgment and punishment for his failure to restrain his sons. Everybody knew how bad Hophni and Phinehas were, including Samuel. Samuel has been raised with Eli. Hophni and Phinehas are almost like stepbrothers to him. He knows how ratchet they are. And he knows that God has declared a word of judgment. And when God speaks to Samuel and Samuel is listening, God gives Samuel the same word of judgment that he gave Eli. God tells Samuel, Eli is done. God tells Samuel, my hand is off of Eli. God tells Samuel that Eli's time as priest is over. And Samuel now knows that Eli is no longer in the favor of God. And this is difficult for him. He's been raised his whole life as a child of Eli. And now hearing from the Lord is going to change everything he's lived by. This word from God is going to change a relationship he's had for his entire life. This word from the Lord is going to turn his life upside down. Let me pause and declare to you that whenever you authentically seek God, whenever you truly want to hear the word of God, whenever you open yourself up to what God is saying in your life, it may cause some radical change. It may lead to your life going in a whole different direction. It may require some challenges and changes that, that are difficult for you. It's sometimes hard to really want to hear God because God requires so much at times. And one word from God can change your entire life. And I declare to you that there's no way you're going to seek God for 40 days and come to the end and nothing change.
There's no way you're going to get to February 19th and God not call a U-turn in certain directions of your life. There's no way you can fast for 40 days and go back to the same thing you were in before you began. When you seek God, God will change your life. Samuel hears this word. And the challenge, tie is not just that it's going to change his life. The greater challenge is that once he hears it, he's got to share it with Eli. He's got to let Eli know that we are no longer going to be in the same relationship we were in now that I've heard a word from the Lord. But beloved, beloved, this is so difficult, but I need to declare it in your hearing that oftentimes when God tells you something that's hard to hear, it will require a conversation with something difficult to say. Say that again, Pastor. When God shares with you something that's hard to hear, it will oftentimes trigger a conversation with something that is difficult to say. When God tells you something that's hard to hear, it will require a conversation that you've got to say something someone may not want to hear, and that is that the Word of God has revealed that our lives are now misaligned with one another. It's a difficult word to receive. Can I push it? Samuel knows how ratchet Hophni and Phinehas are. And I suggest to you that when he prays, when he hears God, that Samuel has a sense already of what God is going to say. Samuel has an inkling of what God is going to reveal. Because oftentimes when we pray about something, we already have a sense of what God's answer is going to be. We already have a feeling of what God's response will be. We already kind of discern what God is going to demand of us. And oftentimes, we are resistant to what God's answer will be. And therefore, we don't authentically pray about it because I really don't want to hear what I know God's going to say. I don't truly pray because I don't want to hear God tell me to stay when I made up my mind to go. I don't really pray about it because I don't want God to tell me no when I've already started making plans for a yes. I don't really lay it on the altar because I don't want God to tell me to let it go and forgive and move on. I've already planned out how I'm going to take her down. I don't really want to hear from God. And sometimes there's some things we really don't pray about because we really don't want to hear what God's answer is going to be. It's hard for God to reveal to you what you've already determined you ain't going to do. Can I say that again? It's hard for God to reveal to you what you've already determined you ain't going to do. One more time for those that are slow writing it down. It's hard for God to reveal to you what you've already determined you ain't going to do. So listen at what Eli tells Samuel. When you pray, if you really want to hear God, if you want to know God's voice, if you want to discern God's will, here's all you got to say. Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That word listening in Hebrew is the word shemaya. And you know what it literally means? It doesn't just mean listening. It means obeying. Speak, Lord, for your servant is obedient. Eli says to Samuel, the same I share with you, that if you really want to hear God, if you want to know God's will, if you want to discern God's voice, 
You've got to go to God with an open heart, ready to surrender to whatever God will require of you and to be obedient to the word of God, regardless of the change, the cost and the challenge it brings to your life. Speak, Lord, for your servant is obedient. Speak, Lord, for your servant is surrendering. Speak, Lord, for your servant is ready. Speak, Lord, because I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Y'all, I'm done. I'm done. I want you to see why Samuel struggles. He's dependent upon someone else. He doesn't know the Lord, doesn't know the word of God. He may be already resistant to what he knows God is going to say. And watch what happens. Y'all, this is Bible study. Somebody's not going to get it, so I'm going to have to say it about three or four times. In verse number nine, Eli tells Samuel, go to God, and this is what you say. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Verse number 10, God calls Samuel, and this is what Samuel says. Speak, for your servant is listening. Okay, you missed it. I told you someone's going to get it. Verse 9, Eli says, tell God, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When it comes time to pray, Samuel says, speak, for your servant is listening. Now, ah, one more time, because you didn't catch it. Eli says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel prays, speak, for your servant is listening. There's a difference between what Eli told him to pray and what he prays. Eli said, when you pray, make certain you call him Lord. And when Samuel prays, he leaves Lord out of his prayer. Lord, 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 Lord. That, that, that's an important word. Lord sets the hierarchy of where I am in relationship to God. Lord acknowledges that he's above me and I'm underneath him. Lord reminds me he's on the throne and I'm on the floor. Lord reminds me he has authority and I am nothing. Lord reminds me that he is God and I am not. And when I pray, I've got to come with an understanding. He's Lord and I'm not. Let me tell you that's so real and I'm done now. Let me tell you that's so real. Because when God is calling you like Samuel, and when God is speaking, and when God is broadcasting his will, and when God is revealing his desire for you, there are one of three responses you can give God. When God speaks, you got three options. In one sense, you can hear God and say, no. No, God, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not letting it go. No, I'm not staying. No, I'm not going to obey. No, I'm not. All of us know what it's like to tell God no. The danger with no is that you're suggesting to God that he's not Lord over you, but rather you are Lord over him and you can tell God that you live your life on your own terms. You, you know, when the boys were young and growing up, they were like typical boys. And everyone told me, you know, watch out for the terrible twos. Let me just declare to you that whoever complained about the terrible twos didn't stick around for three. At two, they are mischievous. At three, they are defiant. At three, they know what they're doing and they test you all the time. When my boys were three, they tested me all the time, especially that young one called Cooper. That boy has some mouth on him. Now I remember at three, I would tell him to do stuff and Cooper would look me dead in the eye and tell me no. Cooper, time to go to bed. No. Cooper, eat your food. 
No. Cooper, go to the bathroom. No. And because I'm his father, because I'm responsible for raising him right, I had to take matters into my own hands when he would tell me no. And I would look him back and I would simply say this, you don't tell me no. When I speak, you do. When I require, you obey. When I tell you, that's what you do. You don't tell me no. I'm your dad, you don't tell me no. I provide for you, you don't tell me no. I'm too good to you, you don't tell me no. I know what's better for you than you know for yourself. You don't tell me no. Whenever you tell God no, get ready for God to treat you like a three-year-old. You don't tell me no. When you tell God no, get ready for God to gracefully break you until you say yes. When you say no, get ready for God to order your steps and limit your options. When you say no, get ready for God to force you into what God wills for you. You don't tell me no. When God speaks, you can say no if you think you're Lord. Or when God speaks, you know what your second option is? You can negotiate with God. You can attempt to say, okay, God, I heard you, but let's work this thing out. Um, I know what you want me to do. Let me tell you what I want to do, and let's find a happy medium in the middle. Um, God, let's negotiate the terms of your will in my life. All of us have tried to negotiate with God. I know I did. When God called me in the ministry and I knew God wanted me to serve full time, I didn't want to do it. I negotiated. I said, God, all right, here's what I'll do. I'll preach on the side. <laughs> here's what I'll do. I'll be an associate minister at somebody's church, but, but I want to go to medical school and I, I want to earn a whole lot of money. And, and when God called me at 16 years of age, I negotiated with God. Uh-huh. God, God, um, I'll serve you, but, but I ain't going to do it full time. I'm not going to seminary. I'm going to college because there's some sinning I need to get out of my life. God, let's negotiate the terms of my surrender. You can try to negotiate with God. The problem is that when you try to negotiate with God, you're saying that God is not Lord of your life, but that you and God are equals, that we can be colleagues in this. That, that we come together and, and, and I propose and you counter propose and, and I offer and you counter offer because we sit at the table as equals. And when you try to negotiate with God, get ready for God to disturb your peace. Get ready for God to wake you up in the middle of the night. Get ready for God to take your joy away. Because when you think you're equal with God, God will disturb your joy and your peace. When you think you're Lord over God, God will remind you, you don't tell me no. So I came by to tell you, here's the best response you ought to have. When God speaks, when God calls, when God reveals, the only real response you ought to have is yes. And that's what Eli encourages Samuel with. He says, call him Lord and tell him you're listening. Call him Lord and let him know you're obeying. Let him know he's in control and you're saying yes. And here is the shout of the sermon. Eli tells him to say that before God even speaks. Before God tells you what he wants, say, yes, Lord, I'm obeying. Before God reveals his will, say, God, whatever you want is what I'm going to do. Beloved, I came by to tell you that what God is looking for are some sisters and some brothers who go before God with a yes before they even make their request. God, whatever you want 
is what I'm going to do. Whatever you require is my yes. Whatever you ask, I will perform. Wherever you call me, I will go. Whatever you desire, I will do. God wants a yes. And the best way to clearly hear the will of God is to have a heart that says yes before God even speaks. Whatever you want, God, I will do. Whatever you ask of me, I will perform. Whatever you desire of me, I will do. Because I'm not dependent on Eli to hear your word. I know you speak to me yourself. I know that once I have Jesus in my heart and I stand in your word, I can hear your voice. And I know that your word may cause some changes and some challenges in my life. But speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God, that's what we pray as we come before you today. Speak, Lord, because we are listening. You are in control and we say yes. No more no's, no more negotiating, but simply a heart that is open to whatever your will shall be. So as we go on into this second week of seek, may we have an open heart to hear whatever you may say, however difficult it may be, whatever change it may require. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Beloved, I don't want to take for granted that you know the Lord and are in God's word. I don't want to assume that you've accepted Jesus and are part of a church where you're being taught and fed the true word of God. So today, if you're like Samuel, and you know that you're struggling in your walk with God, if you're like Samuel and you're looking to be in a place where you're not dependent upon a preacher or a pastor, but a place where you're encouraged to learn to hear God for yourself, Today, God's calling you, and I just want you to say yes. Come on into the body of Christ. Come on into salvation in Jesus' name. All you've got to do is fill that form out online. Let us know who you are. We'll share with you today not only space in our Alpha Street family, but more importantly, God's plan of salvation for your life. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Next week, as we continue on in our journey of seek, I want to share with you the different ways in which God reveals God's will to us. Let's continue on as we seek the face, the voice, the will, the presence, and the power of God.